Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And welcome to this Teresa's plenary session on the arts and decolonizing identity. Um, our organizer has put together a really wonderful group of panelists to explore the notion of decolonial identity in non-European art. Uh, before we dive in, I'm just going to frame our topic and also introduce our speakers. Uh, so let's get started. So decolonization, in a most direct definition of the word, is the process by which colonies become independent of the colonizing country. While there are many dimensions to what this encompasses, our talk today will focus on the aspect of what we could perhaps call cultural decolonization. In the context of art history, we've come to recognize that art historical discourse is not linear. Uh, within this context and to our panelists, I'm proposing the idea that decolonization is a term that often too hastily homogenizes art and art production itself. Um, so a decolonized art world isn't one that's of smooth topography. It's really quite uneven quite and composed uneven. of many disparities. Uh, the panel that we have for this talk, I believe, manifests this disparity. And through this discussion, we would we can hear some of their thoughts towards what it means to continue shaping an art world that favors shifting away from a Euro-American-centric perspective. So with that said, um, we have with us today Karen Cole. Karen is an artist from Malaysia, currently based in Swindon, UK. She graduated from Dyson Art Academy in Malaysia, with an Outstanding Achievement Award in Fine Arts. Karen usually works in oil paint, focusing on personal introspective themes as her work revolves around her childhood, her experiences, and thoughts on social issues. Karen also works with installation, video, and street art. Uh, we also have with us Kubra Kademi. Uh, Kubra is a performance artist from Afghanistan. She's currently based in Paris. Through her practice, Kuber explores her life as a refugee and a woman. Kuber studied fine arts at the University of Kabul before joining the University of Beacon House in Lahore, Pakistan. Um, and it is there she began to create public performances, a practice which she has continued upon her return to Kabul where she worked, where her work was a response to a male-dominated society within an extreme patriarchal policy. After performing her piece known as The Armour in 2015, she was forced to flee her homeland and was a refugee in France until recently in 2020 when she obtained French nationality. Uh, with us today, we also have Henry Mazili Majunga. I hope I got that right. In his works, Henry references his immediate environment, both natural and man-made, to construct scenarios of heroism that seek to champion human strength and empathy. Henry's gathering of objects, spaces, and the existing associations with these objects mimics the processes of identity making that he observes in his native Uganda. Among many achievements, Henry was also the curator and artistic advisor for the first Kampala Art Biennale in 2014. And in 2003, he was also the winner of the Royal Overseas League Art Scholarship. Uh, also with us today is Nashio Mashido. Nashio is a multimedia artist known for his performances, videos, music, and poetry that show intense commitment to, be, to the open-ended potential of language. Currently based in Ghent, Belgium, Nashio was the recipient of the Future Generation Art Prize in 2014. He has also exhibited widely across the world and taken part in artist residencies in Belgium, Denmark, Hong Kong, Germany, among many, many other places. And lastly with us, we have Teresa Kutala Firmino. Teresa is a multimedia artist based in Johannesburg, working with paint, photography, collage, and performance. Teresa's work negotiates trauma, both personal and collective, in her everyday life. Her paintings are constructed scenes of the past and present, which are sometimes intertwined. And so to start us off, I am going to put forward our first question to our panelists. What does decolonized cultural and art production mean within the context of your own experience and your own artistic practice? Nashio, may we start with you? Uh, yes, we may. Um, 
I don't. I, I think uh, above all, it is a question. It or it must be a question as far as I'm concerned about what is it that we care about, what is it that we are committed to, and what is it that we want to achieve, right? Because we can look at this from a political aspect, and we can look at this from a creative uh, aspect, and we can and we must look at this on a financial aspect, right? Uh, uh, and as far as, as I'm concerned, the, the, like my experience is, is one with many different interests uh, uh, at play. And, uh, uh, and of course, because humans are in the center of it, a lot of contradictions come uh, out of the pursuit of having, for lack of a better expression, a more just dynamic uh, uh, of representation of what is the human experience. You know, as far uh, uh, as, as I'm concerned, it, it, it's a matter of accountability and a matter of responsibility as well. Uh, um, I don't know, in, in our uh, pre-discussion on our understanding of what decolonizing has the potential to, to, to mean, we, of course, uh, had different focuses, right? And, and the importance always becomes with clarifying what it is not. Uh, uh, so just to open, uh, as I don't want to babble uh, uh, for, for, for too long, as far as I'm concerned, it's about the accountability of structures, governments outside of what is called the West, which is uh, uh, in, in, a, in a quick uh, uh, awareness of Europe and North America, one way uh, or another. Uh, how do we articulate the relevance of culture, the relevance of our stories, but also the facts that bring together the articulation of what we can consider a, a, a sovereign national identity or collective identity uh, of sorts. What I think uh, is required on, on, on my corners of, of, of the world, it's a mature declaration that we understand the different levels that this conversation must uh, uh, happen and that we understand that how uh, uh, culture, how art, how representation is articulated politically uh, 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 and then what are the dynamics, economical and financial dynamics that allow this or that to occur. So it's always a positioning about what are we talking about exactly and what is it that we care about. We're talking about the dignity of individuals. We're talking about the sovereignty uh, uh, of nations. We're talking about now. We're talking about the future. So I, I guess it's, it's a mature... Uh, uh, um, a mature relationship with what is it that we uh, want to to achieve and who's accountable for that you no know, there's a there's a, a lot of moral discussions here i i personally prefer to to look at uh, uh, the aspect of dignity not so much connected to morality, but connected to a sense of functionality, because this is where we really, really speak about uh, uh, interdependencies, uh, cooperation, collaboration, and the relevance of understanding what different human communities may or may not contribute for the whole. Mm. You've brought up some really great points there. And I thought this actually might be a good segue um, to have a hear of what, um, Teresa, your thoughts to add along to that. Um, for me, <laughs> decolonization, I, is, I can only speak from my own experience mm -hmm. and how I understand what decolonization is. So I wrote something um, before I started the session, and I quote James Baldwin, to be black was to confront and to alter a condition forged in history. And I say to you, to be black, African female artists in this art industry is to confront and alter because you're not even in the imagination of what an artist is or who an artist is. Your mere presence and audacity to break through the canon is seen as a form of violence. You are not even a muse for that is reserved for the superficial standard of beauty. Even if you participate, your presence is expected 
for them to further objectify and exoticize you. But do not despair, for this title, Black African Female Artist, is both a curse and a gift. So <laughs> I wrote this, and then it's like, you know, me trying to understand, especially when I started off in the beginning of my career, you know, as a performance artist, I stopped performing for that very reason of, you know, my presence always being expected um, and, you know, my body being on display. Um, and I felt I had no power in, the, in that exchange with the audience. So I stopped performing and I went into different um, art mediums and realizing that, you know, my, my mere presence in the art industry is a form of decolonization, you know, because I think maybe specifically to South Africa, um, the vision of what a, a artist, a successful, a successful artist is, is very different different from what I imagine, even in varsity. Um, you know, I thought I was going to be a gallerina or something like that. <laughs> and then when I became an artist, I realized just the, the fact that I, I paint, the fact that I make work, is a form of decolonization. And even if I was making work about how blue the sky is, you know, and not making works as necessarily political, but even though, you know, it would be, what I'm trying to say, it's political that I make art, and it is decolonization that I make art, you know, because um, the history of the art industry um, does not, doesn't have my face in it. So the fact that I'm making art is already altering history, altering, um, people's imagination of who an artist could be in the art industry. And I think we definitely want to hold on to that thought because this this idea that the traditional historical art canon is very Eurocentric is something I think we can definitely return to. Um, in the meantime, talking about performance art, um, Kubra, I think it would be good to hear a little bit from you and what you do. Um, for me, uh, well, um, first of all, like uh, to talk about decolonization through art and culture, um, I think it's, I didn't find myself in the, um, or my art particularly in this topic or in this category, but if you see it from what I do with my work is like, um, maybe in a way, what is decolonizing? <laughs> For me, I see it's like uh, it's more liberation. It's more liber it's, it's more to look for liberty, which is like, of course, uh, it's about uh, my own, my own identity in my work. Being woman, being well, uh, being um, Afghan, or in the larger context, for example, in the world. But in another aspect, I'm a Hazara woman in in Afghanistan, and. Um, that uh, recently we are saying that we are reminding the world that uh, it did has been like the world should recognize the Hazara genocide in Afghanistan and and uh, well from that uh, just give you just um, a few context but particularly in my own work I talked about like um, um, uh, let's say like I say I mentioned liberty, or liberty in that uh, I. Um, or from violence, or um, more precisely, patriarchy in my work. It's like I use my body to, um, in, in my performances or um, in my visual works too. Recently, I, I'm, I'm making videos and drawings, again, using in central ease in my own body. Um, so I don't know, in, in a way, it really fits talk about decolonization but if we if I if I talk about like my conflict with or it's facing patriarchy or it comes from the experience of, of my personal experience so um so I would say um well this uh well this has uh, two um Oh, that's my uh, area of my work just to be I have the value of explaining but I can share an image um, that uh, explain how um, um, I'm trying to a share screen yeah. button at the bottom. I tested it before. The second one on the bottom left. Yeah. Are you seeing my icon or no? My my uh, or no? Uh, not yet. Not. 
Twitter. Um, partager. Now you do it. Now, now you do it. I don't want to. Oh, we see the screen now. I don't know if you're um, seeing my screen. I'm hearing back myself. Can you try? Wow. Are you seeing me? Are you listening to me? Probably. Uh, it's not sharing the... Have you tried share screen with the window? I think you can choose to share a particular window of your screen. Window of your screen. Window of my screen. Well, and we're also just getting a lot of um, background interruption noise. I've been trying to have a think which which one of us it's coming from. So I'm wondering if we might try to mute and unmute as we go and see if that works. Denise, are you addressing me? <clears throat> no, I think just generally as you were speaking, to I could still hear you, but we were getting a lot of um, noise interruption not, and we're not really sure from where. So um, I would suggest we could try the mute and unmute function as we, as we go along. Um, but how shall we move on for now until we figure out the screen share? Yeah, I think so. I'm trying my best. <laughs> no, I know. We, it's, a, it's a fairly new platform for all of us, technology. <laughs> um, could we hear from you, Karen, perhaps, and your thoughts on this? Because I also know your, your practice does not, did not, strictly speaking, fall into this decolonization. Oof, what have we got here? Screen share. Uh, Cooper, have you unclicked the screen share? I think it's not happening. Okay. I will have difficulty of now talking about my work. If I can mm -hmm. even show one picture. Uh, Karen, over to you for now. Let me try this okay. mute thing. <laughs> can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, yes, yeah, so about this topic, the decolonizing within the arts and culture. Right. See, this topic, I see that it's... Um, you know that it's much bigger than what we can understand at uh, some points. And uh, looking back into myself and within my own personal experience, um, I see it's like quite a unique position as well because I'm a fourth generation generation Chinese who grew up in Malaysia and not knowing Chinese but only learning the English and Malay language and um, conversing that way within my community and growing up that way as well. And my work has always been, um, in that sense, uh, in a search of my own identity and my own culture and understanding about, um, you know, before even going beyond like my childhood experiences, like I'm, I'm already just trying to understand my own being, my own childhood and uh, experiences and having to learn how to, you know, speak my mind. On Are things you seeing I, me? I don't hear Oh, anybody. yeah, I think the screen share is activated again. Uh, Kura, maybe just uh, deactivate the screen share for now if we could. <laughs> just so we can have the <laughs> screens of all our okay, speakers.
you know, Karen, it's actually really interesting to hear. Um, I think I don't know about your your background. I actually very much uh, understand that feeling of searching <laughs> for yourself. I, yeah. I too actually was born in Hong Kong, but raised in Australia. Uh, two colonized countries or formerly colonized countries yeah. and I also do not uh, read and write Chinese <laughs> but there's yeah. always this kind of gap a midway gap and of yeah. course Australia has this very strong identity as well that I do so I understand that that, that mm. feeling of being somewhere along the middle yeah I think a lot of people can relate uh, especially like you know where your families have migrated to you know somewhere where you, you were originally from or, but then now it's like uh it's an open term already because it's everything is globalized and um that's why when the term decolonizing it's like almost it feels that i'm a form of a colonized colonized kind of structure as well when you know when you learn about my own country in malaysia where how it come about went from you know malay is usually the majority race and um with the people in malaysia but then for the past like hundred years or just recent years, where you know we have um, trades and uh, people coming uh, in and out of faster uh, countries and migrating completely, mm-hmm. and um, there's always like that uh, understanding of uh, oh my own country of you know during colonization and. Um, even then that we still have our own sense of culture and our own practices that um, we we do have and uh, that we cultivate and we actually try and maintain, um, you know, the, the culture that um, we usually um, um, have had for centuries. And, um, you know, because even though I'm a Chinese, but I feel like... Um, you know, I am a Malaysian and we actually, I actually am embrace about the history of Malaysia and uh, appreciate the arts um, that has been practiced like uh, throughout the years and, and the parties and the people that come together that actually still try to um, and, and actually successfully, you know, bring Malaysian um, art like prior colonization and whatnot like to the forefront and to the international stages. Mm, and then, of course, um, personally, I'm more familiar with history in Southeast Asia. So I know within the art history in Southeast Asia, there's a lot of speak about, oh, you know, their, their art production was influenced by, by the French. They're mm. influenced by the Dutch. There's a lot of that referencing going on as well, and even yeah. to this day. Mm. And with I, that, um, yeah, it's. I, I'm sure Malaysia, I believe, actually also has this even yeah. today. Mm. Because that's why I think we have, um, you know, art residencies and things because we are in a constant state of um, diffusion and uh, exchange of ideas and understanding and um, being aware of uh, how people practice differently and how to appreciate the different cultures that exists within the different um, communities and countries. It's just about being respectable to other people and each other as well and knowing our boundaries and, um, yeah. <laughs> and we'll definitely return to that a bit more. And lastly, Henry. <laughs> Let's hear your thoughts on this. Uh, I, I would like to pick on uh, where she has uh, concluded on respect. Respect probably makes the world go round. Because at the end of the day, you as an individual can play your part to try and influence through events, events. But at the end of the day, your role might not be as significant as you would want it to to be or as you would want people to perceive it. So in a way, we are all looking for validation. And uh, when you look at the, the theme, decolonizing identity, that has already happened because you cannot colonize identity 
people will always be who they are. Whether you subjugate them, whether you deny them resources, whether you put them in tins and can them and ship them off to whatever, they will still express themselves individually and they will retain their identity. So for me, I believe that we just have to be, if I'm attempting to relate to that issue of to be or not to be, we just have to be. We just have to express ourselves and leave the judgment to the historians, the curators, and all these people. And I'm speaking specifically as a visual artist. I have been making art for almost 20 years now. Now, I have done it as a practice. It is my calling. I'm a priest of art. That's what I do. I don't have to impress anybody, but I would not like to let down anybody. So if I keep working like that, at the end of the day, I will have done my bidding to the whole human race. Now, we've had several conversations of people who are subjugating others for economic reasons, obviously. The, the issue has always been economic. Whether you talk of power, uh, kings and queens and all this stuff, it all boils down to resources. What we have in terms of resources, how are we sharing the resources? Who has got the lion's share of the resources? Is it Bill Gates? Is it uh, all these new people who are in the, in the, in the, in the ICT world? Those are all questions that come up as investors because we are all here keeping ourselves busy as we wait to pass on. So what is the nature of your business is the question I always ask myself and it's the question that I would like to ask whoever is on this forum. What is the nature of your business? I'm a painter. I love to paint my family because I have been locked down for almost a year. And I just access my family and my garden as my source of inspiration. That is how I survive as a creative. I cannot do other things because I cannot move out of my compound to them. I don't travel because I don't have access to travel anymore. So these are the substances of my reality. And I make the best out of those circumstances. And I make sure, as a hedonist, as a guy who is always pleasure-seeking, I make sure I enjoy, I enjoy myself. If I'm not enjoying myself, then nothing really matters. I think that's just a fantastic motto for life in general. And speaking of um, economics, it actually reminds me of something that we, we did touch on in our pre-talk session. Pre and it would be great to actually talk a bit more about this and talk it again, share it with our, our floor today. Um, Nashto, I remember we talked about um, like what, you know, we often do overlook the economics. We often do think that trade and finance and, you know, that's a completely different world to the arts and cultural production, but it's not true. Um, and I'd like to put the question out there is, in a sense, what, what can we do? What, what, what can, what would you guys suggest we could do if you we were to, to pitch to people? How do we help the economics? How do we bring this to people's attention? Well, if, 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 if I'll, if I'll express and, and make it about, uh, respect, one of the first things, it, it depends where, right? Let's talk about the West because we can only uh, uh, take seriously this decolonize whatever uh, uh, if we are uh, in, embodied within a kind of a Western uh, uh, departure point. So what we could start to do is stop lying. 
So the challenge that I would put in terms of education, something and being in this uh, conference in particular uh, or, or in this gathering, what we can do. And I was just reading there on the comments, there's a teenager who's studying uh, uh, art and design and all of that. What we can start to do, and it will have tremendous economical impact, stop lying. So we know, like we talk about history, right? I have the tendency to say in a few talks that my grandmother has, doesn't know what history is. See, she does have a relationship with time and space. So we have to understand what history is, the construction that it is. And within that construction to express time and space, a lot of lies. So the responsibility starts by let's, because we're talking about this influence right in Southeast Asia, Asia of uh, uh, Dutch or French. Uh, and again, historically speaking, scientifically, aesthetically, uh, uh, and, and one can go deep in the sciences, like we talk about engineering, architecture, and all of that, the contribution that the, or how the Western identity uh, 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 or the identity of the colonizer, let's call it, is constructed upon many different lies. One can call it whitewashing, one can call it different kinds of things. So education. Right. When we look at education, the, the, the institutions that frame and legitimize uh, 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 the discourse that we are now expressing that requires a sense of decolonization, then it's about the truth. Because there is one thing. I know where I'm from. I know what my roots are. The people being lied to are people in Western schools, universities academies. So uh, f there must be an indignation from parents, from people saying, can you please stop lying to our kids to make what happen? So the economical discussion begins uh, 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 on a question of perception and understanding of the power of perception to install any kind of given discourse. So I think that's one thing that can be done uh, within Western territory, that we collaborate just to celebrate the goddamn truth, if I'm allowed, and I'm trying to be mild uh, uh, in my expression. Uh, uh, so if we want to start to have a different dynamic, it's just to let's uh, uh, mm -hmm. rewrite history not to be on the right side of it, because it has no side, but to uh, celebrate humanity in the plurality that it is and the contribution that different individuals, different territories have done to what now we can celebrate uh, uh, as the Western canon, right? And, and so we would understand, like Henry was saying, make it about respect, there's not so much a decolonization to 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 occur, but there, let's call it for what it is. There, there needs to be a relationship or a greater uh, a desperation for a relationship with truth. That could be a good start, no? Absolutely. I think many of us would agree with that. And actually, I think it's a, this is a good time to bring up a comment that I see in our, our chat box here. Uh, this could take a good hour to, to debate um, amongst us. Uh, we have Diana who's asked, who's commented that history is written by the victorious. It will always be biased, agree or disagree. History, in my humble opinion, influences the arts as well. Uh, would any of you like to comment on that? Yes, I would like to respond to that. Can I? Okay. Absolutely. Um, I, yeah, history is always written and told by the victorious. That's true. But it doesn't mean that the people who are vanquished don't have their own history. You know, it's always there in the background and it's always there influencing events. For example, a long time, uh, there was no art in Africa, but many African tribes were making lots of 
at facts. Let me just interrupt Henry just to say there was yes, no art yes. and not even thought, man. <laughs> yes, 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 true that. So what happened at the turn of the 19th century is that few adventurous uh, Western artists, uh, like Asso, Mondrian, they saw this craft that has been that had been made over 400 years. They saw it, and when they interfaced with that, it kind of changed the trajectory for modern art. This can apply to Japanese art, can apply to Chinese art. So when the victors are busy telling their story of victory and building triumph arches and all this stuff, they vanquished are always continuing with their existence and their contribution to humanity. So I am not worried about the people who write history because they write it for their own perspective, for their own consumption. I worry about individual stories. What story are we creating individually? Because at the end of the day, that's what really, really matters. Thanks. Cooper, I wonder if you had something to say. I saw you jumping at the screen just now. It's yeah, great. I can hear um, uh, Henry um, point to something really interesting and important. In my experience, uh, he's, he, like you pointed out, the, back in Africa, there was not art. Uh, even in, in, in case of my country, like how it is being projected to the world and how how people know it, how see it, like from like globally, it's just war, nothing else, and misery, nothing else. We don't think there. It's. I'm saying this because I really have. I was questioned like, um, well, uh, well, today, I mean, there, um, well, something like they always ask me that if you have any reference from the art history, the art history that it is written here, I mean, in, from, in, in Europe. So everybody is asking me if I have any reference from there, if I knew anybody, anybody, and how I entered to art school, how I become an artist. So in a way, it is interesting to be questioned, like from your own, I'm 32 years old, and I have to reply this, that, how I become an artist. So I just simply say, and well, I was a child and I was already an artist. I was always considering myself an artist. And but growing up, I learned I have to go to school. I should have. I have to learn things. I have to. People should recognize me as an artist. So I mean, learning this, it was like through my own life experience and and from childhood, I was exp like I was just exploring and exp expressing myself. So I mean, it's interesting today. Um, having even done art school like fine arts and having even studied uh, art history i should be questioned that wh who has inspired you whom whom you learn i um, mean did you have maybe have any artist in your family and i said no i don't have no i didn't have my parents never go to school but they never practice something neither but i mean it doesn't mean I did not grow up in a in a family or in an environment there was the creativity itself didn't exist it has I mean it is there and we uh, we are I'm I've been nourished like in poetry in like in in other forms not particularly I, I would have a paint in a brush and paint in my hand and paint or use my body as an as a as a performance artist especially being performance artists, like, is, is there anybody who is doing, so it's, it's so much of a question, is there anybody, is there anybody? Or also another question is like uh, being, being feminist, I, as, I, um, as I practice in my art and plus myself in like, uh, plus I introduce myself too. So when I do that, like eyes become big and ask me, do you have, how did you, I mean, did, how, when did you learn who was the first feminist? Uh, it's like so much of like, I've been asked that if I have that, if I've studied, then I become. No, I didn't become. I was feminist. I was rebe mm -hmm. re rebelling in front of, I, uh, uh, rebelling in 
first of all, the first man that I stand in, in front of them, I look in the, into their eyes and I said, no, they were my, it was my brothers. It was in front of, in, inside the family. But I mean, it doesn't mean as my, me, myself, having read anything about feminism, I like, mm. it doesn't mean I didn't have that within me. So it is just, it is just so fascinating to be here. And there is always a big question that you should always tell, give a reason why I become, because I have seen this artist. Yeah. I have seen this theoretician who was giving this. I mean, it's just, everything is westernized. Everything is from mm -hmm. the right art history or a history. So it is means that you do you do you yourself don't have. I think the artist we as a, a Henry um, also said that. Well, I'm so happy to um, draw my family and, and like have our own personal history. That is, I think, that is the best source to to. I mean, it's like well, I mean, you yourself live in a time and a space where you are affected by so either power politics. I don't know, a lot of social issues that are shaping us and giving us reason to express yourself what you think, who you are. I mean, in, instead of being with, I mean, well, being <laughs> Afghan woman, Afghan artist was like, in 2015 cost, cost my life almost. <laughs> but, uh, but I would say, I mean, it is just, it is so fascinating to always constantly, I have to talk about myself and I have to, and I must reply that yes i have when i was child i have seen this artist and then i learned that wow this is beautiful i want to be an artist that is wrong that is i mean that is that is a very i mean that is that's the worst question you can ask someone and i've been asked this constantly and always <laughs> and you know mm. with that thought uh, Teresa. I'd like to add to that because I think um, I want to <laughs> touch back on what Nasha and Henry were speaking about. And then for me, coming from a, I think in South Africa we'll call it a Model C school, is the fact that, you know, education um, is seen as, um, a Western education is seen as something that is universal. So their science is universal, their mathematics is universal, and everything that comes out of the West, the West is seen as something that, you know, it's world, literally, the West is world history, when actually we have, we like, if we look back, even in African history, in a Asian history, how we understood science and how we understood economics, and or even you can go as far as, you know, astrology is very different from the West, and then what... What I think the mistake a lot of governments do in terms of the education system is just take on the Western um, education system and just feed it to, you know, to the youth and tell them like, yeah, this is how mathematics is. And there is no other mathematics outside of it. And you cannot function in the world outside of this mathematics. And then this can also be read into art and art history. And maybe that's why people have those questions of like, you know, I think Western culture always has this thing that you need to have a philosopher. Uh, you need to have a, a theorist. You need to have someone that inspires you. You know, but it, you can. We can argue that in some African cultures, we don't have this idea of the philosopher. You know, we have ideas of like the community. You know, in South Africa, we call it Ubuntu, where you we just you know, even if we had to look at like um, we, we like for example oral oral history, you don't ask who the one who's the first person to ever tell that story. It's just a story that the community knows. You know, so. It's very interesting how um, until now in our day and age, we haven't explored other forms of science, other forms of mathematics in the world. We've just accepted that, you know, the Western way of seeing the world is universal. You know, I, I just, feel I like... Want, sorry, sorry to, to interrupt, yeah. but I did, because it's very important to, to establish that I believe in this group, because we have exchanged some, some vibes uh, as well about this, but it's true for a lot, a lot of people inside art and artists here, if I may say, I don't want to misrepresent anybody, but to say that we got very clearly that we're talking about two different territories, right? In the sense that there is an accountability to be had uh, uh, in the West. So it's very important that we are not uh, 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 positioned as, as to be 
in, in this particular statement or in this particular debate, demanding something necessarily for the West in favor of how we tell our own stories, right? But just within the West, like this story can be told better, more, more accurately about how certain things occur, how certain uh, uh, techniques, aesthetics, different kinds of things were obtained. So there are two different works, right? It's because in our governments, in, in the African continent, uh, 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 Afghanistan, Malaysia, China, Southeast Asia, like there is something for us to do as well, for right? So, and, and, and we are not confused about that. Uh, 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 it is very important to bring these points of clarity. Uh, there are things that we can exchange, we can collaborate, but there are certain things that we've got to be accountable for in each territory. And what we are saying here is that Europeans, uh, no, no, we're not asking you to tell our story more accurately. I'm to tell your own.